All right, you're listening to the Fan to Fan podcast. I'm one of the hosts, Bernie Gonzalez, and with me today is I don't know what what do you want to call yourself, Jacob, Twilight Zone expert. You're certainly a writer. You're certainly an author, Jacob Trussell. Jacob, how's it going? Uh, good, good. Thank you for having me. Uh, and I guess Twilight Zone expert would be correct, even though I feel like I am far from an expert in this long, long running show. <laughs> you have something in the parentheses in the back of your name, and it is it involves the Twilight Zone. So all things being equal, you will be the Twilight Zone expert. Let's go with that. We will today, go with that today. At that's the right. Very least between us, I would say that that's fine. Between us, anyone who's watching or listening, you know, let's we'll just consider Jacob the Twilight Zone expert for now. So a little bit about Jacob, author, writer. I found your work online because uh, you've written for One Perfect Shot, Film School Rejects, and also magazine that I like in the world of Fangoria is also Rue Morgue. So everything from prestige horror, you've addressed that in movies like Hereditary, 10 Best Lucio Fulci movies. And I think we're going to probably end up having to do an episode, Jacob, where we talk about the beyond, because I think we can both absolutely geek out about like the dreamlike ethereal world that is the beyond. Um, you covered from Canon to Corman, uh, the origins of like the early Marvel movies. A lot of things that I'm sure folks who probably know Marvel from the most current MCU iteration may not know about Corman's Fantastic Four or Canon and the Spider-Man movies that never were. Uh, you're also a self-professed fan of creepy puppets through your love of Goosebumps, Magic, a Child's Play, and Annabelle, although I thought you mentioned maybe one of the most recent versions, not necessarily the biggest fan. Um, and I did hear also on a podcast where you were waxing poetic about uh, William Castle and all of his movie theater theatrics, the 13 Ghosts remake. Um, and also you brought up a movie that no one has ever talked about, um, except I thought me, and it was the Atticus Films movie, The Beast Must Die. So thank you, Jacob, for having good taste that happens to have a Venn diagram with some of my taste. The Beast Must Die is uh, one of my favorite college like midnight movie memories. Uh, I was from Austin. I'm, I'm from the, I'm from Texas and I lived in Austin for seven to eight years. And I went to the original Alamo Draft House uh, before there was a ton of other ones. And they had a uh, weekly midnight movie uh, every, I want to say it was every Thursday. And uh, I would not, this was like early, early, like kind of film history for me. And one of them was Beast Must Die. And I thought that it was a very, you know, interesting, weirdly done werewolf movie. And then right at the end, right at the end, maybe like 10 minutes before they reveal who it is, you get this one minute clock. So what is it? The wolf countdown, I think. Yeah, I think that's about right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you just have 60 <laughs> seconds to turn to your neighbor and be like, oh, who do you think the actual werewolf is? Who do you think it is? Who do you think it is? Uh, just like that's uh, that's the type of thing that I, I just come to movies for. <laughs> no, and, and I remember watching that on broadcast TV and when it got to the werewolf counter and, and, and you know, I was just looking at the person next to me thinking, wait, th this is there's participation involved now like we get to engage with the movie and i'd stumbled on it being a hammer horror film fan so seeing peter cushing in there you know obviously seems like later in his career but you're right it's it's such a such a, like an underrated forgotten film the beast must die but you know the fact that you get this audience participation moment to try to figure out it's, it's kind of like clue by way of hammer horror and then werewolf movie yeah, that's actually a great way to frame it as sort of like a clue movie because it also isn't this like serious horror movie because it's still, you know, amicus. It's still in that hammer vein of kind of cheesy, but also still trying to get a little like gore and creeps in there. But yeah, it's, it's not as salacious as William Castle doing the, well, before you walk into this theater, let's have you sign this life insurance policy that will, of course, make every local radio station talk about my movie and then hopefully we'll get people into theater you know it's not like that but it's still it's still pretty unique oh yeah oh yeah but yeah i think william castle is definitely a much more that's very american thing to do comparatively <laughs> to uh, what the what those uh, across the pond were doing absolutely especially compared to hitchcock where he's like <laughs> you know you can just hear hitchcock in his voice being like well i'm just going to make this kind of classy artsy horrific movie and william castle's like and I'm going to have the tingler and I'm just going to put this electric thing under the chair and make people scream. And that's what I got. That's what I'm going with. <laughs> hey, we're still talking and loving both. So 
kudos to uh, both Hitchcock and Castle. No, absolutely. So you said you grew up in Texas and now you're in New York. From what I was able to gather from the internet, uh, at one point you were acting full time. Is that right? Yeah, well, um, you know, acting is always a job that you have to have another job to continue to work on. Um, and I went to school in Austin. I went to a, a small private school called St. Edwards University. Um, I worked uh, professionally uh, on stage in Austin um, while also working, you know, another job like you always do, uh, especially in non-coastal cities. Gotcha. Um, and I experienced a lot of great success through that. Uh, and then I moved to New York um, and I worked here for uh, a, a span of years um, until sort of I had this big shift in my life. And um, part of that big shift was finding a new way to channel kind of what my art meant to me and what I wanted to do with my art, because I felt like I had been hitting almost a ceiling of what I wanted to get from what I was creating in the world. Um, and part of that was wanting to take back autonomy for myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as an actor, you're, you're, you're constantly waiting for other people to do other things. You constantly need other people there around you. And I always had this uh, slight envy of like studio artists and people that paint and, and create things with their hands because they can do that's, that's all that they need, you know? And I found by um, almost reflecting on a lot of stuff I had been doing before I really fell in love with acting and really fell in love with stage work. And that was writing. Um, one of the things that uh, really came back to the top of my mind uh, once I started to kind of really focus on this was a um, little short story that I wrote when I was, geez, like maybe five, six, and it was typed out on a typewriter because this was before we even had a computer, um, you know, back in those early 90s days. Uh, and it was like a little uh, horror story about uh, very much, very much stolen, like directly from a Goosebumps story, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, you know, a couple kids go to a carnival and sneak in and see some monsters and things like that. But that kind of made me remember that this was um, the, the original seed of, mm. of everything, of everything, of wanting to create worlds of wanting to write about worlds and, and, and exploring and discovering these worlds. And um, what the writing that I have been doing um, over the past five years, because it's really been about five years since I've started on this journey, um, has just given me the opportunity to dissect stories and learn about new people that I maybe didn't know quite as well like Rod Serling. Sure. Um, uh, I've, I've been writing uh, a book about poltergeist and uh, re learning really a lot about Toby Hooper's life and Toby mm. Hooper's career, like within this story, uh, in incredibly inspiring. And, and these things just like feed back into me and um, the inspiration and the, the things that I'm, I'm finding coming out of myself in terms of my art uh, have been just, incredibly rewarding and uh the the journey that i've taken to get here with all of this all of this stuff that i've done has just been um uh very <laughs> not what i expected but uh definitely the career path that i think my 12 13 year old self will be like oh cool dude you know <laughs> so hey <laughs> happy to be here and and you'd mentioned on on a podcast the power up podcast with emily batsford that you'd kind of yeah. moved on from full-time acting to writing to gain control, something that, you know, exactly what you're talking about now. And you'd mentioned, um, and I had to write this down because I thought it was such a, such a good line, Jacob, holding on your own work, holding your own work up versus creating something and tell, like telling your own thing. So it seems like over the last five years, as you've kind of gone through that process, um, making that progress of being able to hold up your own thing, is that really where, working with uh, one perfect uh, one perfect shot film school rejects like your your articles and, and to be fair the thing we're going to talk about the most today the twilight zone the book is that where a lot of it has been kind of you know kind of come from those last five years as you found your own voice and also taking things that you were passionate about and don't don't think i didn't hear that um i think it was also on the same podcast where you did a presentation to your class about dawn of the dead so it seems like all of this kind of came together <laughs> 
Yeah. If yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 No, I, I'm, I'm, there's a couple different times that I've used like horror in, 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 in school work, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, regaining control, telling your own stories, finding your own voice. And for me, one big thing and, and what, what has been great working with something like film school rejects in one perfect shot and Rue Morgue is being able to find places that I can tell my voice um, that is uh, supported by this structure, be it a website or a magazine to get some sort of perspective, some sort of idea out into the world. I mean, part of the reason why I started to write more long form is because I was just writing these long Facebook posts about things that I liked, about horror movies, about whatever, um, specifically because I watch one horror movie a day in October, uh, at least at least one. Um, so I would write about that. And then I started to realize like, I can do something more with this and I can, and I can create more from that. And I think um, one thing that theater uh, and, and acting, um, not so much like film work because film work is, is, you know, that's not ephemeral. Um, but this idea that stage, and I'll steal this line from um, uh, someone that I worked with in Austin, uh, creating theater is like creating tiny demolitions where you're building all of these things up just to destroy them and mm. then potentially never think about it or talk about it ever again. And, and that's, and that's there. And like, you have this one moment, the singular experience that is like really, really important and vital because it's never going to happen again, but also you're never going to have it again. Mm. Like, you're not going to be able to take that with you 50 years from now and be like, look at this cool thing I did outside of like some pictures, but with, a, you know, with a book, with a short story, with an article, like these things, I, I'm looking back and finding in my own research, like finding articles 20 years ago that were written online that, you know, 20 years ago is 2002. Uh, so like these things are, are, have a much longer shelf life that I think is, uh, you know, especially as you get older, like you want to have that. I want to like point to something and be like, look at that, look at my library. <laughs> no, it's, it's interesting. You talk about with, with that quote from uh, your, your uh, peer in Austin, because that reminds me of what is it? The thirties and the forties where you had, these pulp novels that, you know, arguably were just were meant to be disposable. I mean, you know, you had kids taking comic books, wrap, you know, rolling them around, putting them in their back pocket because they were me never meant to be collectible. They were just meant to be cheap paper. You read it, you move on to the next one. It's not meant to be held in any type of valuable regard. And in some ways, you know, where we are now, where you have something like, you know, in the world of comics, where I, I'm a big fan of comics, you get something like a, you know, hardcover omnibus that's printed on the best paper but the idea is that it's meant for longevity it's meant to be more it's meant to be more evergreen to have a sustainability unlike like you're saying like a theatrical work where is it fair to say like you're on the stage you're giving all of your energy for that one night's performance and maybe you're trying to you know make little you know adjustments along the way throughout uh throughout a performance or throughout um a run and then by the time you're done, like you said, then after that, you just go to the TNT, you blow it up, you take the lessons learned and you move on to the next, next thing because that previous thing doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, no. And, and you know, it's, uh, it's, it's different flavors too. It's like you, the, the experience that you get that you're never going to get again. I mean, in, in, in some ways, I feel like there's a lot of that on social media now too, mm -hmm. because you're only getting certain social media stories for uh, sure. 60 minutes at a time or, or something like that. Um, so I think that that there's that bit that has like an exclusivity to it that makes stuff like that popular and still, you know, have a lot of uh, intrinsic value in terms of like a piece of art, but in terms of like where, you know, I have gotten to in, in, in my space of what I want to have from my art is I do want to have those like things that you can put onto the, the, the hardback bound, you know, classics, especially when it comes to things that weren't expected to live beyond, you know, 40 years. Like look at all of these eighties, seventies, sixties horror movies that we love that, you know, potentially would have never made the transition from VHS to DVD if it hadn't been for, you know, those of us out there that are like, Ooh, we have to, we have to hold on to this because then this can, you know, be remembered. And I think that's the big thing. It's being remembered. It's, it's having something that you can point to at the end of your life and be like, Hey, at least I wrote that Twilight Zone book. <laughs> that's, that's the perfect transition, Jacob. So we're going to use that because I don't think you'd get it any better. One of the things you've written long form, something certainly that people can have on your shelf is your first book, which is the binge watchers guide 
to the Twilight Zone, an unofficial journey. So from what I gathered, it's part of the Binge Watcher Guide series. Uh, has a number of different sections. Before you watch, if you only watch one episode in the Zeitgeist, it's available on Amazon. We'll talk about it kind of like towards the end so folks can find it. They can get a sense for you. But tell us, you know, tell me the origin, like what started, how did this book come to be? Yeah. So um, this book, I feel very, uh, it's a very lucky story. It's a story that I I, I, I couldn't imagine in, in my entire life. But so uh, in March of 2020, something crazy in the world happened. Um, and uh, the website that I was working for, Film School Rejects, we wanted to create something that could get people's minds off of everything that was going on. So uh, Neil Miller, who is the editor and founder of Film School Rejects, he came up with this idea that would be um, a March Madness bracket for binge watching because we're all home, we're all binge watching. <laughs> Let's battle it out to see who's going to have the best one. Um, so everyone pitched ideas, threw things out there. And because uh, the world was crazy, I, I, I had a very last minute pitch and I wanted to do Tales from the Crypt. So I was like, Tales from the Crypt is, that's a, that's a hell of a good binge watch. I love those, I love those stories. But Tales from the Crypt, because of rights issues, whatnot, it's hard to stream. And I was like, I don't want to tell people to binge watch something that either they'll have to go to YouTube or they'll have to go and buy a $70 box set. Sure. And as I was sitting there, I was like, what can I pitch? What can I pitch? Uh, it just popped in my mind, the Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone is a show that we have been binge watching through the holiday marathons for years since arguably the begin like the the show ended we've been binge watching the show and we never consider it really binge watching we always think of it as as, as these marathons it's all, twilight zone and i love lucy are sort of mm -hmm. two sides of a different coin in terms of how we view devouring shows back to back to back and it being something that was normal before binge watching became this you know word um so I pitched the story. I was like binge watching the Twilight Zone, it's the original binge watch. And uh, I, I kind of gave that same spiel. Uh, and I broke down five episodes that I thought would make a nice little binge watch um, and posted that. Uh, Twilight Zone made it, I think, to the second round, but there were a lot of good options in that binge watch. So didn't make it to the end, even though I still, you know, have a, have a, a good feeling about binge watching with the Twilight Zone. Um, but so I wrote this article and um, Lori Perkins, who is the uh, owner of Riverdale Avenue Books, she reached out to me because she had this binge watching series um, and she read the article. She thought it the, the, the kind of the angle that I had for it was a good angle for it. And she asked if I wanted to write this book. Um, it was the first time I'd ever thought about considered potentially writing something as long form as that the closest thing that I had done up to that point and it's the reason why I had like a shred of confidence that I could do it is for Film School Rejects I had written two um, uh, complete rankings of uh, TV of episodes of a TV show mm. so I did one for 30 Rock and I did one for Brooklyn Nine-Nine, two shows that I had just been like binge watching the background of my entire life. And I was like, I can write these pretty easily. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think 30 Rock maybe had like 160 episodes or something like that. So I was like already accustomed to having to like break down um, writing like, you know, capsule reviews, capsule synopsises of these things. Uh, and when I... Um, had this book in front of me, I was like, well, I guess I can do that just on a longer scale, on a larger format of it. Um, so that's kind of the beginning of it. What uh, made it an even easier transition into thinking about how I can approach writing it is that uh, Lori has specific sections for each of the binge watcher books that she wants to be um, uh, uh, the same for each individual one. So uh, Zeitgeist, Before You Watch, Best Step, or you know, If You Only Watch One Episode, these sort of main section, sections became um, the framework that I had. And that was like a built-in skeleton for me to see. And then it was about what I'm going to throw onto it. So it, it, it it really, um, the the doors were wide open for what I could do outside of those like specific sections. And 
that I imagine that's got to help your confidence too, because there is this framework, there's a skeleton where you can bring in your perspective, your passion for the show, but you get to work within the sandbox that at least kind of, I don't know, sets up the lines. You're like, all right, well, I know how to talk about this thing because I love it. Like you said, it's kind of been running in the background of my mind this whole time. And you're telling me I just have to stay within these lines. Like, oh, okay, this, you just made my job a little easier. Oh, oh, one, one hundred percent. Oh, absolutely. Um, and 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 yeah, and really just like giving me the opportunity to throw what I was feeling, what I had in my mind. That's something that I, you know, uh, has been sort of the the foundation of my writing because so much of my writing was about getting what you know all of these thoughts running around in my head onto a paper, and um, so much of that uh, was very easy to do with Twilight Zone because of what Twilight Zone really is. And it's this show about ideas more than what you see on screen. Um, And once I really picked up on how much of a, for lack of a better term, uh, social conscience that Rod Serling was very intentional about putting into the show, coupled that with the fact that I was writing this over the course of the earliest days of the pandemic and everything that was happening in the summer of 2020 all through that year, uh, that became a very uh, serendipitous backdrop to writing this book because I started to see these parallels between what Rudd Serling was specifically talking about with Twilight Zone and everything that's still happening that was he was specifically commenting on then. Um, so that's really the, 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 the basis of it. And, and I chose to go down this path of, of looking at it from the themes and the perspectives is because there's really great Twilight Zone anthology compendium books out there that are not mine, that I use to help write this book that would make my book obsolete if I just tried to do that again. If I just tried to write yet another, here's a synopsis, here's some background about what happened with the show. Like people have the Twilight Zone companion. Uh, Mark Zickery's companion is the be all end all. It's the one that helped me write this book. Like it's the one that people should go to and read. But if you want to read about the thoughts and the ideas and the things that Rod Serling was playing with, that's why I wanted this to be. Um, so, you know, buy them both. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> that's the, that's the, that's the top, that's the start of it all. No, add them both to the cart. And it's something in the first two sentences of your book where you mentioned, uh, so you, so you put, you know, the twilight zone, maybe you haven't seen a single episode, but you still know the twilight zone. And I thought th- that was a great way to start the book. Um, because I remember the first time I don't remember the exact first time I watched the show, but I remember the feeling of the first time I watched the show, like watching it with my parents and watching the show also through their eyes because they were products of the fifties and the sixties. So they had lived through, you know, JFK assassinated voter acting, uh, voter civil rights, Rosa Parks, you know, uh, Vietnam, all of this stuff. And, and for them, the show meant something very different than it did for me. But I could still see how even as a kid watching it, and this is, again, well before streaming, well before even binging, and arguably even before some of the, you know, the more notable like sci-fi marathons that we'll we'll definitely talk about soon. I think uh, I think that's what made the show so timeless and something that you cover incredibly well in the book that all of these topics that Serling is addressing, you know, uh, social issues, racial issues, xenophobia, war, mortality, technology things that, you know, are still a part of our lives today become relevant, become timeless. And in ways where, yes, I remember early days in the pandemic, you could hear online people doing rewatches of Sopranos or The Office or Seinfeld or Friends. And, you know, based on their availability, just like you mentioned with Tales from the Crypt, oh, Friends is being taken off Netflix. How do we find it? It was a, it was a warm blanket. It was a comfort that you knew you could revisit those shows because, it, I, I have to imagine it's it's like a procedural on TV. So although it doesn't seem like, you know, I live in the Chicagoland area. So we have every Chicago, Chicago, like municipal Chicago PD, Chicago fire, Chicago medic, Chicago, I don't know, uh, sewage system, whatever show it is. Uh, Austin didn't have that. New York does. But <laughs> you still get those procedurals where I think the reason why people like those shows is because there is a predictability. You go through plot point one, two, three, you kind of know what's going to happen. And in the end, everything gets reset. 
And outside of a few minor changes, you know, the next time you watch the show, it'll ju- your, your favorite characters will be there. And something interesting in shows like Sopranos and all that, that bring that golden age of TV to, you know, where Matt Weiner did with Mad Men, where you have a, maybe a mature, you know, quote unquote, level of storytelling compared to some of those more disposable shows and opposite of the episode, uh, episode of the office feels like any other episode there's some great episodes but you could put it on in the background and it just makes you feel good at a time when what's happening in the world does not make you feel good so i think the the timeliness of covering not only binging and in, in this kind of marathon marathon watching but also the fact that you covered the twilight zone it's just like this i mean again jacob you could not have picked something better because i think you know Outside of the fact that we didn't want to see what was happening outside our outside our windows happening, but something like the Twilight Zone, if anything, at least for me, reminded me that these topics, these ideas, these issues are this isn't the first time for me because Serling has now approached them in a way that is incredibly intelligent and incredibly timeless and incredibly approachable. Yeah, no, 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 I I. Um... I, I, I agree. I think that uh, Rod Serling's intentions about using the Twilight Zone as a, as he called it, a bully pulpit um, was, or at least he might've called it, I might've called it that, who knows? Well, either way, that's what he used the Twilight Zone for. Um, and, and, and what's great about the Twilight Zone is that it does have that warm blanket effect that warm blanket of you turn on an episode of the twilight zone and and even though every episode is different and there's always a twist ending there is still that sort of sense of expectation you have that creepy opening sequence you know there's going to be some twist at the ending you know some weird stuff is going to happen in the middle and that's what you come to that's what makes you feel good about watching the twilight zone it's why so many of us watch the twilight zone as kids even though we didn't really know what was happening underneath it all but that's what is so particularly special about the Twilight Zone is that it has that sense. It also has that sense without it being too overtly dark and dramatic like a lot of new shows now do. There's still a very, you know, Mayberry RFD vibe to to the way that it's presented, uh, even though they do have some really phenomenal uh, cinematographers and and things in there. Um, But it still has this underlying substance that other shows at the time and other shows to that to today's still don't have. Um, and I think what makes a show like Twilight Zone timeless is that because it has that feeling that you can just watch each episode over and over and over again, because it you know has that nostalgic blanket vibe to it. Um, but it has that longevity because Serling was able to get these ideas that we wouldn't be talking about uh, publicly on TV for, for at least in entertainment wise for decades. And he was able to get it in there uh, when the civil rights movement was just starting, when all of these things, you know, nuclear anxiety was still a huge, uh, it was just starting to be a huge uh, fear for so many, especially someone like Serling, who was more in the anti-war activism, um, that, you know, this show continues to hold that weight because there's so much stuff supporting it that, um, you know, you might not think about on first reflection, but once you really start digging in, like I did, because I really wasn't very uh, aware of that side of the Twilight Zone until mm-hmm. working on this book, and then uh, it just sort of <laughs> unlocked a key with a key unlocked a door. You know, <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, and you mentioned that in in that in the first chapters where you talk about Serling's frustration, like the studio system, uh, broadcasters, executive, and sponsors, things that I was kind of. I, I got, I think, peripherally aware of, but to, to your point where you mentioned where you use one of the quotes, I found that it was right to have Martians saying things Democrats and Republicans could never say. And reading that, I'm like, oh my God, this is great. I mean, the fact that you used it in, in your book, but also that kind of sums up Serling's ability to, like you said, use his bully pulpit from, but not necessarily in, you know, a, you know, no pun intended, a preachy way but rather kind of like a, all right, well, this is what's happening around us. You know, McCarthyism, the Red Scare, intolerance. I'm seeing all of this. How do I talk about it? And at the same time, not go through where where you highlight incredibly well in the book, some of the issues where he had to go through sponsors and executives to try to tell his viewpoint without necessarily having to compromise what he was trying to say. 
Yeah, well, there was a, I want to say that the Twilight Zone, I don't, I, the, it's never been like confirmed for sure, but I want to say that the Twilight Zone really began when uh, Rod Serling wrote, because he wrote a lot of teleplays before, and, and teleplays were like 60s filmed stage productions, mm -hmm. essentially with really great like close-up cameras with some incredible, incredible directors. Uh, well, he wrote a ton of them, and he wrote one called uh, Noon at Doomsday or Noon on Doomsday. And this, he, when, he, when he presented it to the, uh, to the sponsors, because they were the ones that were doing this, they were the ones that were controlling television at this point, um, they wanted to pretty much change the core essence of the story. And he wrote Noon on, Noon on Doomsday uh, in reaction to the murder of Emmett Till and the uh, trial, the sham of a trial that happened afterwards. And he wanted to write about these, you know, insular communities that perpetuate uh, bigotry in the name of keeping social morals or whatever you want to say it. And he, he wanted that to be very much what the, what the story was about. And the sponsors made him change everything change anything that potentially could connect to Emmett Till they had him change it all around he tried to then do it once more with a uh, teleplay called a town has turned to dust mm -hmm. and a town has turned to dust stars William Shatner in a really really fantastic role people always forget that William Shatner was a really good actor um, but uh, that's that that story is about a um, a, a bigoted merchant mm -hmm. who won't sell uh, his wares to um, local, uh, uh, I want to say, um, immigrants from Mexico. I can't mm -hmm. exactly remember where it was at, but then all this like stuff happens, mm -hmm. the uh, yeah, classic Serling morality at, at play. Um, but once again, they made him change so much of that that it really took away kind of the the punch that he was trying to make about you know black lives at this time of 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 you know history, mm -hmm. and the frustration from that uh, could only be <laughs> immense. I can imagine from someone who was very intentional about writing this stuff um, that he recognized that the only way that he can tell these stories is if he tells them in a way that the sponsors won't pick up on. And that's where the Twilight Zone came from, is that he wanted to tell stories that were bigger than what he was allowed to say on television or what anyone was allowed to say on television at that time. And that's the birth of it. And that's where it came from. And it came from the fact that it comes from wanting to talk about this specific trial. It just says, almost everything that I need to know about mm -hmm. what he was trying to do and how that can parallel to what so many other creatives and artists are doing today uh, in reaction to these works. But the fact that he was doing it at a time when no one else was like, hell yeah. <laughs> and, and the fact that he was so consistent. Cause I mean, I think the, it was 150 some episodes and he wrote about 80 plus to 90 of them. And when I think of, TV shows specifically that are so connect, uh, so connected, so tied to one creator. Like I think of like Larry David and Seinfeld, like Chris Carter and X Files. I think it's uh, Vince Gilligan with Breaking mm -hmm. Bad. It's kind of more more modern day shows. David Chase with Sopranos or like Aaron Sorkin and West Wing. But because of Surly's contributions, and I know he brought in you know great writers, Richard Matheson, Charles Beaumont to work on the series. But the fact that he had such a big part, not only in creating, but writing so many episodes. And then to your point, being able to bring in his social political commentary into all of his work, and then to be able to do it so successfully. I mean, sure, like any other series, there's a few episodes that maybe, you know, just don't get on top 10 list. But he, if, if he had a batting average, he, he was like, in that special wing in Cooperstown of Hall of Fame, because there are very few singles in the world of the Twilight Zone. There are a lot of triples and a lot of home runs. Yeah, which is, I wish I had the quote in front of me, but Rod Serling, and this is something that I feel like it's always good for, for especially for writers to hear. You know, Rod Serling, like we, we see all these Twilight Zone episodes and like they're, you know, home runs, right? Like there's so many great episodes, 
But when Rod Serling described uh, his input to it, he was like, you know, there's like 30 good episodes. There's like 60 <laughs> terrible episodes and there's like 50 really bad episodes. It's like, no, there's not. But, you know, that's uh, that's that's also, I guess, maybe the 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 classic artist self con lack of self confidence or whatever but you know uh, the consistency is i think the biggest differentiator with the other twilight zone tv shows that have come out and also i would say with a lot of just anthology shows in general is that by having this one through line this one voice this one person that's like this is what i want the show to be about kept it very solid and like there's the fourth season but the fourth season is its own beast mm -hmm. um but the 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 fact that he you know was consistently getting his stories in there and there's you know he wrote a lot and there's plenty more that he at least contributed the story to or that he you know he was in those you know writing meetings and he was working with it there was definitely a a very core group of writers as many of the ones that you mentioned too like George Clayton Johnson as well um these writers you know they were the 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 meat of the show but the fact that Rod Serling was this shepherd throughout the entire thing it's not something that you see in the 1985 version or in the 2000s one, and unfortunately not in the most recent iteration mm -hmm. either. Um, and just from the sheer fact of looking at the writing credits, like it, 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 Twilight Zone is a show that needs one voice showrunner that writes a lot of the episodes to have a chance of matching something similar to what Rod Serling himself was doing. Not maybe so much what the show is doing, because there's, I love the 1980s Twilight Zone, but like there's a lot of uh, the that that consistency, that thing that he brought to it. It's it's what's missing from the other ones, and I think it's uh, it's 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 what you said. Like it's adding in those those extra elements that make it something more than just a show about aliens and monsters and short order cooks with three eyes. <laughs> no, absolutely. So before we get into like the whole marathon binge watching aspect of this, right? Um, I, I wanted to ask you, how was it like uh, watching the episodes, I guess, essentially as like self-assigned homework? Because you're going through these over the course, I, I, I believe it was, I think you mentioned a month or so. And you're watching, you know, you're, you're dedicated in the sense that you have to just to keep up that pace, watch X amount of episodes every day. You're taking notes. You're probably bringing in your own memories of having seen the episode and how it's impacted other works of art where you see like, oh, like, you know, the, this is now like the, like, I don't know, to serve man arguably is, isn't that just V the miniseries from like the eighties, you know, just yeah. told through like a, a more sci-fi TV miniseries lens, but how was it like kind of going through it with a, I don't want to say an academic lens, but maybe a more journalistic lens. No, uh, with talking to a lot of freelance writers who write stuff in the entertainment world, it, it the, the, the running joke is that we are doing little homework assignments for fun, constantly doing it. You know, you're, you're researching something that you love, so it doesn't feel as much like work, even though, you know, the, the enormity of the, of, of the product that you're trying to do it's still work like it there's some days that i did not want to think about twilight zone and i still had to think about twilight zone um i'm just but, picturing too it has to just change the dynamic of how you how you watch something where you can't necessarily just get lost in it because you have to i, I i'm just guessing the pause button gets used more often oh yeah oh yeah, yeah i had to pause a lot just to write down notes i like i'm i'm someone when i'm when i'm watching something that i'm writing about i'm just constantly taking all of those like one lines that pop into your head that that is that thought that can potentially then become the key to the entire 500 words that i'm trying to hit or something like that um so yeah watching it, it it's not the same as watching it as a as a regular binge watch i i I still haven't actually gone back to watch the Twilight Zone just for fun in, <laughs> since I wrote this. Um, but I think that's just from the very nature of I watched like hours upon hours of the show just on repeat, on repeat, on repeat, because I wanted to not only get a good sense of the show, but like I wanted to you know, really feel in my bones and have some time to, to think back about it and, and, and reflect on it and think about like where those themes are at. And then, you know, going back later and watching the episodes again to be like, did I get that right? Was that the right <laughs> thing? Um, but no, I mean, the, the, the tediousness of it is um, 
really only there towards the very end when you want to get it all done. And I wanted to be like, I just want to get through these last three episodes of season sure. five, <laughs> um, especially after the the 12 or 13 hour long episodes of season, season four. four but, sure. Yeah. But um, no, you know, the what's great is that it gives you a great scope of, of really how consistent the show was too um and 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 just running across episodes that you forgot that you remembered and that you had never even heard of before many season four episodes i didn't even know i mm-hmm. never had a chance to see before um and and when you get to things like that like even if the 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 quality of the content isn't great it's still really cool to be like man this is you know i i you're just discovering it for the first time yeah, exactly. And it's something that I love about, you know, 80s forgotten horror movies, especially like really, really low budget ones. It's like these people spent so much time creating this thing. And here it is 60 years later, or whatever. And I'm seeing it for the very first time. And these people's lives are now extended. Like those are really cool moments that come from, you know, reviewing something that is so massive. So I think it's 159 episodes. And mm-hmm. it's just like, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a long commitment, but and this kind of goes back to a point that you brought up before, it makes it such a good binge watch because you don't have to watch every episode to really get a good feel for the show or to even call yourself a fan. You know, if someone watches two seasons of it and they're like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. I'm like, you're good. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. You know, but yeah, no, no. Being able to just pick up the show uh, and, and, and run with it helps when some of those episodes aren't super great. Like you, you, you don't feel, and as you'll, as you see in some of the, the, the blurbs that I wrote in here, like some of the episodes I could, could always say so much about. Sure. No, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And especially but, when you get into like the binge watching aspect, um, cause I think that's where in the, before you watch section, you have this, you ask the question, like, where's the twilight zone? Is it a feeling, a sensation, a state of mind? And for me, like, I remember watching it on TV with my folks and then eventually here and there, like in the summers, whenever they would have the Alfred Hitchcock hour or, or something like that, or one step beyond. And then I would see twilight zone. I'm like, okay, I think I like this a little bit more Then you see night gallery. But I think for a lot of people, like what is the twilight zone for them is it's the sci-fi channel, like new year's marathon or a holiday marathon. And that's something that you, you mentioned in the book, how it's remained popular for decades after it's first aired because of those two reasons, binge watching and the holiday marathons. So I was, let, let's kind of get into that because I did a little bit of research, but then you did a lot of it talking about like the great mystery that is how these things came to be, you know, the origins of how regional TV in LA and New York kind of created this format of watching Twilight Zone in this kind of marathon format. Oh yeah, no, no, no. And it's, it's so funny. I feel like so much of that history specifically is literally lost to time because they did not get these things down in the internet because it didn't exist. Someone on um, Wikipedia did not make the Wikipedia update for us. <laughs> yeah, right. Where were they in 1975 when we really needed them? Uh, no, but this, the, the fact that Rod Serling didn't sell the syndication rights or didn't retain us, mm-hmm. didn't retain the syndication rights and he sold the show to CBS lost him tons of money, lost him. So him and his family, especially after he died young, like lost him so much of this generational wealth that is just tragic as a a fan of Rod Serling and uh, someone who would love to see that support continue to go to his family. But the fact that he did is the reason why the show is what it is. Like, I, I I think he, (laughs) he didn't sell, he, he, He didn't get money from the syndicated rights, but the fact that CBS was so bullish about getting the show into every single home in every single syndicated slot that they could meant that this show now was being seen by far more people than who would have originally watched it. And so in those like between 1964 and probably 1978, sometime in the late seventies, you know, the fandom grew from that. It grew from seeing those syndicated episodes from, I I know I, it didn't really get over uh, overseas for a while, but they also were getting these sort of like bite-sized syndicated things that they could, they, they could scrounge together. Um, and then the sort of that fandom that grew the sort of like early cult following for the show culminated in, um, KTLA in LA, 
uh, they ran, I want to say it was a Thanksgiving marathon and it was a huge hit. They did, I want to say six hours of the show. Um, and, uh, people loved it. They did it the year after that and the year after that, and it went on. WPIX, WPIX in New York also say that they did it around mm. the same time. And it so all seems sh- like it's like kind of early eighties, like 81, 83, like around there. Yep. It was like right before the, uh, the Twilight Zone movie came out. And I think that the, 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 the hit of those, um, those marathons being popular, not to mention the fact that there were so many people like Steven Spielberg, who were not Mm. only fans of Rod Serling, but had directly worked with Rod Serling, were getting into the space where they could actually make something that they wanted to make as fans. And what else would they want to make as fans if not a Twilight Zone thing? And I think that, you know, not even so much from that creative element, but the, the people that were funding these movies we're seeing these huge numbers being drawn from these marathons of this old show like it 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 it, it gave it its second life and it it's why I, I i always feel so sad that rod serling died so young because he didn't get a chance to see this like i think he would have gotten a lot of money in perpetuity from all oh of this sure stuff, sure you know <laughs> but like hey if 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 he hadn't made that terrible financial mistake, we potentially would not be sitting here discussing it quite as much as we are. Um, It would have taken on a completely different life, but from that one mistake grew this entire, you know, fandom generational community. You know, I've never thought of it that way because, and maybe these aren't the the same, they're not as parallel as as, I might think they are, but I think of Night of the Living Dead and George Romero and like the you know, the, the father, the godfather of zombies and how, you know, just making a mistake as far as how the copyright is, is addressed, then puts that movie in public domain. And then I guess you could argue if it wasn't for that mistake, as much as it may have cost Romero, his family, you mentioned like the generational wealth for them, if not, then people horror hosts throughout the, the nation, people like Sven Gulli may not have shown Night of the Living Dead in the seventies and eighties. And you wouldn't have people like Robert Kirkman who then like make the, the walking dead because of it, or something like it's a wonderful life because it's in all this rights turmoil. You know, it, it's only because of that, that maybe uh, local affiliates air it during the holidays when they can't get their rights on, you know, like holiday in or more well-known holiday movies. So what do you do? Well, you air the cheap thing, Santa Claus conquers the Martians and, you know, wonderful life. And then people watch that because it's available and then it becomes the thing it becomes. It's an interesting way to look at maybe the twilight zone that because, you know, unfortunately Serling sells it uh, because he just wasn't, wasn't able to maintain that production. He sells the syndication rights to CBS. They keep it out in the public eye. And like you said, now we end up talking about it because we grew up with it because it was always out there. Yeah. And I, I think too, I don't think Serling thought it would have this second life. I don't think he, I think he liked the show, but at the end of the run, I think he was a little done with it. Um, I don't know if he would have been done with genre in general. I mean, he did end up going on to co-write Planet of the Apes, like sure. <laughs> that I think would still be within his, within his bag, but like, he just didn't think it would be so popular with so many other people. And uh, I, I I don't think George Romero was in the same boat as thinking <laughs> that way, but that's such a good parallel I had never thought about. It's like, yeah, it, it, it's these things that happen that then give these works exposure that don't give the artist what I believe the artist, as we all believe the artist deserves to be credited. But because of that, almost in like a, Napster way of like, you know, growing these generations of fans who are, you know, unintentionally stealing this work and coming back to it. And then they, you know, share it with their friends and share it with their friends. And then people buy it and then people, you know, make big Hollywood movies out of it. And, and it's, you know. and it's interesting because, like you mentioned, uh, Picks, which I only know because a uh, fellow co host Pete is also, uh, he grew up in New York. So we always talk about picks, picks, picks. It seems like they had a, like a commercial round when he was growing up. But I, I was reading how uh, WPIX would air Twilight Zone along with Honeymooners. And when I think of shows of 
you know, kind of like the, the beginnings of TV in the early 50s when, you know, baby boomers after World War II, TVs become affordable. You get suburbs and everything like that, that Honeymooners, I Love Lucy, like you mentioned earlier, Leave it to Beaver and Twilight Zone. And when you put all of those things together, some of them are, are certainly products of their time. Some of them are very problematic to watch in, in, a, in a modern day, you know, society, you know, something like Honeymooners does not get the syndication that I Love Lucy does. But even in watching shows like I Love Lucy and Leave it to Beaver, they represent an idyllic kind of suburban, you know, kind of nuclear family um, that's obviously afraid of nuclear war at the same time or atomic war at their age. But mm -hmm. it's not all those that have maybe had iterations, movies, uh, reboots like Twilight Zone has, where Twilight Zone has kind of circumvented all of these things because, yes, you get episodes that deal with uh a leave it to beaver type, you know, like family and nostalgia, but because it's an anthology, because it's doesn't have like this large narrative that you have to follow, you can just pop in and out and to all the Thanksgiving, New Year's Day type marathons that are out there. If you're a viewer and you're in LA or, or New York in the eighties and some of the big markets, right? The coastal markets. And then as other affiliates, other channels get to show this. And this is well before like sci-fi be kind of made it a staple of their schedule. It's an easy way to eat up like 24 or 48, 72 hours of your programming. So I, I imagine it's also a lot cheaper than running, you know, maybe more modern day shows where you're going to have to pay more for the license or the rights to air them. But because of that, like, you know, th it's all just incredibly interesting at a time when binge watching has become a thing. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. And um, I feel like, especially when you talk about like a, a Leave it to Beaver and Honeymooners and I Love Lucy, these shows that, you know, came around in the, in, in roughly the same time period, uh, if not like a little bit before the Twilight Zone, I think what really helps Twilight Zone have this longevity and the reason why people come back to it in a way that, you know, they don't with these other shows um, is the fact that it's not so tied to a time period. It's not mm -hmm. so, you know, uh, very much Leave it to Beaver is very much time period. I Love Lucy uh, very much like all of these things that feel tied to this one specific era. And while Twilight Zone is very much about one specific era, it is also, you could watch it 40 years from now and, and it won't feel like it was maybe on right after an episode of Leave it to Beaver. Like it could have happened in a different, you know, era in, 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 in some ways. Um, but you know, we, I think what makes it such an interesting, different binge watch too. And I think we've become so much more interested in binge watching things that are a little bit more dark and bleak. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people binge watch Hannibal and I love Hannibal and I get a lot of entertainment out of it, but it's also a really rough watch sometimes. <laughs> like it's hard to get through. Uh, and the Twilight Zone has stuff like that within it, unlike, you know, binge watching an I Love Lucy episode when you're home from, homesick from school or something, binge watching a Twilight Zone episode, you'll still get that like nostalgia blanket that, you know, remembering watching it on mm -hmm. your grandmother's uh, living room uh, uh, floor, like having these extra elements in there sort of seeding in and seeding in and then, you know, being able to then step back from it and seeing all of these stories, all these different unconnected stories, then painting this much larger picture of like, oh, he, this isn't a show that had like one episode about an obsolete man that was clearly talking about something involving, uh, you know, European politics at the time or geopolitical politics at the time. Oh, that's not just one episode. Like that's, you see another episode that has something about, um, you know, uh, Nazi apologists. You mm -hmm. have all of these other episodes about it, these different things that make you realize that there is, it's an, it's an anthology show that's unconnected story-wise, but there still is a through line throughout this thing. And you can call, you know, I, I kind of play with it in, in the book is like, you can call that through line, the twilight zone, that thing mm -hmm. that like constantly falling into this abyss of, of, of nothingness of, of what the world is like, it's, uh, it makes for an interesting binge watch too, because then it's, it's not so dark and bleak, like something like a breaking bad, where you can still go back and, 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 Hoover these shows through that you might not want to with uh, with something a little bit more 
rough to watch. Mm -hmm. um, and because you're not watching one specific story, the gratification that you're getting from the Twilight Zone comes from almost a different place because it's not about completing a story. You know, people, you, you start and binge lost because you want to know what's going on with that island. Uh, when you start and binge watch the Twilight Zone, it's not the same direction that you're going in, but you're still getting something just different than you would get from any other story art show. And it, when you mentioned Lost, it's interesting because I, I remember watching Lost when it first aired and how, at least for me, it felt like it lost steam a bit towards the end. But what kept me watching, and I'm assuming this was part of the writer's room, is that you had all of these influences. There, there felt like little tinges of sci-fi, a little bit of horror, a little bit of fantasy in, in all of this that was very grounded by a good high concept. A bunch of people on a plane, crash land on an island, and then sometimes hilarity, but mostly like not so much hilarity because things just get like really shit dark and crazy. And then we're going to look into people's past ensues versus like something like the Twilight Zone where for people who might say, well, I don't like sci-fi and I don't like horror and I don't like fantasy, Serling, the writers, the, the producers, they were able to package sci-fi and horror and fantasy in ways that were digestible. And even in the fourth season where, you know, it gets a little long in the tooth in some episodes or you're like, but you guys did this so well in 22 minutes. Why do you have to do it in 40 more yeah. plus? Um, but to, to be able to do that and still be relevant and have a consistent approach, not only in the casting and the cinematography, but to just have that level of quality episode in and out. It, it's, it's what makes uh, Twilight Zone a unicorn. But again, to your book, it makes it for a perfect marathon, for a perfect binge watch. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Um, yeah, I... Uh... Sorry, I just had a complete brain fart. No, 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 no. Yeah. Well, the well, one thing we could do is get into some of the mini binges that you bring up in the book. Yeah, you go from please. Like the scariest, the funniest, the cerebral. And I think that is just, I think in the same ways that Serling and crew, you know, were kind of all over the map in the best of ways. Like that's the best compliment, you know, where they were not afraid to tackle something that was maybe arguably a bit more romantic or gothic. But then at the same time, the next episode, do something that was about a far flung future and still do it so well and so grounded. Um, you bring up in the book different type of binges. And I think that it's incredibly, like, I'm glad that you did this because for someone who may not be, like, they're kind of peripherally aware of the Twilight Zone because they they were flipping channels on, on New Year's and sci-fi channels. And you're like, you know what? I'll watch one or two and that's okay. But I like the way that you kind of package them into themes where, if you want to get your your scary episodes in, well, here's your scariest binge. But if you want to watch something that's a sweet binge, like there's also something for you on Valentine's Day. Like you, they kind of run the gamut for all of them. So you could not only watch all 156 and then write a book like you did. Uh, you could also watch like 10 episodes and like have your own mini binge on this one theme. Yeah. And like uh, the, the way that I kind of approach this was I, I was thinking back to all the times that I've Googled episodes of the Twilight Zone. I'm like, hmm, what's the scariest episode of the Twilight Zone? And I'll find a list. <laughs> oh, what's the, the, the funniest episode? And I'll find a list. And, and I wanted to present that as like a, you never need to Google this again. Here's a, here's a <laughs> list of all the ones that are definitely, definitely spooky. But like back to your point about like all of these mixtures of genres together, this allows you to see kind of exactly how varietal these stories and these things were uh, because they were being packaged up so these you know tiny little nuclear 50s families would see something maybe more fantastical because this was still pre moon landing so a lot of the space travel stuff no you're right because right? i think I right? was it jfk in like 61 did the whole like new frontier and that was supposed to be like the biggest new agenda to the new deal so yeah. you have all of this happening and you know and then on top of that you have like the the beginnings of like the cold war but you know I, i'm assuming that the idea of space travel have has to have been incredibly abstract like you mentioned the nuclear family and it was probably defined by pulp novels and ray bradbury and people who were like well if you read my book i'll tell you all about how spaceships look and you have kids being like okay well 
Steve Dicto and Jack Kirby are showing me what these things look in Marvel comics. But, you know, then you have Rod Serling saying, all right, with a cardboard box and some good lighting, I'm going to show you what a spaceship looks like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. And just like he had the opportunity at like right before everyone knew what would happen in space, like to to really theorize of like, here's all of these different ways. There's uh, there's one uh, hour long episode of Twilight Zone season four. I can't remember off the top of my head what it's called, but it's about a man who uh, is in a like early kind of circumnavigating uh, in a small rocket um, as like a space uh, a test pilot. Uh, and he comes back a different person. His family can't recognize him. Like these little things that he was able to sort of seed into the to these nuclear families of like here's all these different ways that you can think about all of these different life anxieties and showing them showing it to them in uh, you know purely science fiction at that point. Um, but uh, back to the point of these of these binges like. Being able to, to pull these out, especially when you're trying to recommend this show, a show from the 1960s mm -hmm. or late 1950s, early 1960s to someone, you know, that's 15 to 16, like you want to be able to be like, here's, here's your, here's the deal. Here's, here's your hand. These are the <laughs> ones you're going to check out. Uh, and, and, you know, being able to, to zero in on, on which ones could potentially resonate with someone, you know, the most, like if, if, for instance, like I'm, I just have the scariest binge up here. Uh, a, a lot of people might look at the twilight zone and think that it's not, a, it, it might be scary. It might have these like really like dark themes to it, but maybe it's not like too, too macabre like too really weird then you can recommend to someone it's a good life mm -hmm. uh about the little boy with godlike powers that tortures everyone around them um or you could watch long distance call which is about a little boy whose grandmother dies mm -hmm. then the grandmother starts calling him back on the phone to tell him to do what kill himself mm. like that's 1960 like that's that's uh, that would still be rough to see on tv people would still have a hard time watching that on tv today but to then show someone and be like this was from x number of years ago like those are the cool things that you can pull out of the twilight zone and be like look how modern it still is look how daring it still is and uh i was, I was gonna say in the scariest binge because you bring up the living doll and i I always think of that, you know, it's the episode with the creepy doll that also has Kojak in it. And I, when I see stuff like that, it's like I imagine someone who's watching it now may only see the through lines. Oh, you mean Child's Play? Chucky? It's like, no, this was so much before that, that this may have been. Well, I guess unless you talk about like the movie Magic, uh, you know, uh, from I think it was like the 70s. Yeah, it's uh, was a little bit later, but Magic <laughs> definitely inspired by Twilight Zone. <laughs> no, absolutely. It's like you, you kind of put this all together and it's it's in the to, to kind of quote with the, one of the formats in your book. It's in the zeitgeist. It's the thing that, you know, probably helped make Chucky that or or at least that trope of the idea of what we now consider to be the doll that comes to life and whether it's yeah. the wooden dummy or technology, right? Like a drone or, or something like that. It's like, yep. It comes back from things like the living doll that was released in 1950 something. Yeah. And, and what I, and what I love about the living doll, because that's one of my favorite episodes. Also, it's one of the most well-known episodes since why I go back to that first line in the book of like, you know, twilight zone, even if you don't have sure. seen an episode of twilight zone, I think the living doll is such a great, uh, example of the whole like social idea of the Twilight Zone being more than just a show about a, a killer doll is that as scary as Talkie Tina is in that episode <laughs> and how just like really, really dread inducing the entire thing is like the through line and the the like the emotional core of that show is this abusive husband and this you know mother trying to save her daughter sure. from yeah. this man and the 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 this man's psychology and 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 um the kind of what's going on in his in his mind and with his mental health is then being projected onto this doll to the point that it that it kills him um and these aspects of it like you can remember the 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 creepy talky doll 
But then once you go back and rewatch it and you're like, woo, mm -hmm. there's so much more going on here that we pick up today because of the you know TV shows that we watch nowadays has so much of that that's making your mind think of what's going on underneath. And when you go back to watch older shows, you might not always get that, which is why Twilight Zone is so different is that it has this really, uh, really threaded in there. Um, but 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 to your point too, like it's also a, a a living history of of so much of genre and and storytelling that has been completely revolutionized by what Rod Serling was doing in a time when no one was even considering doing it, and especially in a kind of genre field mm -hmm. that people still argue about whether or not. It's always been used to comment on what's happening in the world or if it should never be in there. You know mm. what I mean? Like the fact that this, this, you know, show that started it all in some regards uh, was started with that in mind of being a, a, a conduit to tell something more. Um, one, like it, it, it fills me with a lot of inspiration going into it of like, oh, well, you know, you're, if this is what I want to do, I'm sort of, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a precedence, there's mm -hmm. a path, there's, there's a thing that you can always point back to and say, this is where it began. And this is like the moment. Um, I also think too, if anything, if you didn't think Serling was already great, like, doesn't it put him on even that higher of a ladder on the pedestal? Cause, yeah. and I, and again, I'm going to make the parallel with George Romero. He was asked for many years if zombies were supposed to, be a representation of communism and the red scare and, and that feel that, you know, something that was done, you know, maybe arguably more effectively for the John Hughes crowd in red Dawn where, Oh no, like, are we all going to be taken over? Let's all band together as teenagers and fight them off. But in you, in night of living dead, you have a much, a much darker, obviously a much more uh, horror oriented take on that idea. And I just remember reading interviews with him and I saw him once speak and they were asking about, it, and he was like, deny, deny, deny. Like, no, I didn't do that on purpose, but you can't help but see it because it feels like it's not in the background, it's in the foreground. And the fact that you cast a black actor as the lead and then the ending the movie has, not, not to ruin Night of the Living Dead for anyone, but it has to be, it, it's hard to argue that it was done on purpose. But I'm going to take George Romero at his word and say that maybe it was just part of, you know, an unconscious decision in his directing. Fair enough. But yeah. then when you parallel that with Rod Serling, the fact that he's out of the gate, he's like, yeah, I'm going to tell you what I mean. And I'm going to do it in ways that I want to do it. And uh, I think I'm going to do it really well. It's like no hiding. He's like, hey, I'm just going to tackle all these. Although I, know, I think he in a in a Wallace interview right before I think the Twilight Zone came out and you reference it in the book where he's like, no, 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 I'm not going to talk about, you know, social political issues, you know, and you could almost see him look at the camera and wink and be like, come on, like, you know me, I'm going to do oh, this. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, no, no. And I think too, like, like, cause I, I, I've been thinking about that George Romero quote quite a lot. Um, just thinking about how, you know, social issues and horror all get mixed together. And um, I also too think I'm like, are, are really, really George, it's not about that. It's mm -hmm. not, but that then gets to sort of uh, something that I take uh, very important about, you know, what I write about in my research about it is that uh, I, I'm very interested in the takes of, the, of what they were thinking at that time, what was going on at that time. And while he might not on hindsight be like, this wasn't an mm -hmm. intentional thing sure. because of what was happening at that time, all of the things that were happening around him affecting this work, even if he didn't intentionally do it, intentionally do it, it still came out from him because he was still, you know, the, the consumerism in Dawn of the Dead, that connection is there, even if like the stuff he was doing in, in Night of the Living Dead is something that he more uh, frontly denies. But yeah, but the fact that he, you know, couldn't, we, when you look at Rod Serling and, and him having the confidence to be like, I can do it. But that's also too, that's to kind of get to the, the zeitgeisty portion of, kind of who Rod Serling was and how it kind of umbrellaed into uh, 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 the Twilight Zone is that he was a confident dude. Like this guy was probably, okay. So to, to, to give a good uh, summation in, in my own personal way, there's, a movie out there, somewhere out there in the world 
maybe in the back of my mind, maybe in someone else's mind. That is essentially Van Wilder. Okay. But Rod Serling sure. is Van Wilder <laughs> on his college campus. There's an amazing story. Uh, who knows how true it is based on, you know, his own propensity to be Rod Serling, uh, <laughs> that he to impress a girl on college campus, he went to Antioch, um, a very progressive, very like uh, much in line with, I, makes sense that he made Twilight Zone having been at that college. Uh, and knowing that a, he goes there like after World War II and everything like that he went through. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, he, speaking of World War II, uh, he was a paratrooper in World War II uh, and he fought tooth and nail to get there because he was underweight and they would not allow him to get on. And he was like tenacity. And he got into the, <laughs> to the, to the program, but he wanted to impress a girl on his college campus. So, uh, he would, um, to make some extra money, he would test parachutes. Uh, you know, that's wild. Uh, but he got one of his buddies who would fly the planes that he would test parachutes on to fly him over the college. So he could then parachute in to ask the girl out on a date. Once I started hearing that and hearing other stories about, you know, he wasn't a Lothario, but he was definitely a ladies man. Mm -hmm. Um, and hearing all of these stories of like, who, you know, we see Rod Serling, we see the guy in the, in the, black suit and tie with the smoking cigarette. It's and, a very and, curated image. And you mentioned you found the word for it in the book, his staccato voice, because you could tell that it's all purposeful. Oh, yeah. And it was just like the these like very clipped things. He was nervous. I, he was someone that wanted to be an actor. He There's a great quote that uh, all writers or actors uh, giving dialogue to the audience of their mind or something like that. Um, They're like doing the lines in their own skull kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And th that's very much Rod Serling. Um, but he, you know, he was nervous on screen. So he has that, you know, bluntedness, but because that, you know, infectious uh, vitality that is him in his own life uh, informed that and why people were so, I think, uh, connected and like they gravitated towards him so much and they were so like interested in him. But I actually think it's funny too, because the first instance of Rod Serling being seen on screen, uh, delivering one of the narrations is in the last episode of season one. So it's all just straight voiceover for the first season. And then in the last episode, it's about this writer who um, the people that he writes about uh, uh, come to life um, and they'll come through the front door. And if he writes about an elephant, an elephant will pop up. And the only way that he can get rid of them is by cutting off a little bit of uh, his dictation because uh, he used dictation to write all these things something that rod serling also did um he would then take the the tape burn it the person would go away so at the very end of the episode after all of you know the drama happens uh rod serling appears on screen and it's still the rod serling that we would you know later come to know the figure but it's a little bit more a little bit more lighthearted. He's not, I don't think he's in the black suit and tie yet. He still has this sort of like bon vivant good air about him. And it makes sense because the ending of it is a huge joke because he then gets cut out and Rod Serling disappears. And that's the end of season one of the Twilight Zone. And it's just such a, like a nice little meta bump at the end of this first season of this show that then once again gets to the underlying kind of comedy and jovality of him even though as he would later become known as he's working in television as this angry young man mm -hmm. and that angry young man is who would then go on to create the twilight zone because uh, all of the the teleplays that he had been doing up to that point were digging into very nuanced realities that people weren't digging into specifically around corporate life censorship, all of the other stuff that he put in there, um, but more told with more straightly, frankly. Um, so you have a, 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 a teleplay like Patterns, his, his first big hit about old, young, new ways of running a business um, that really shook up the world. They never did teleplays a second time 
but patterns was the first time that they were like, we need to have a second performance immediately. And they did another performance a week later. Uh, and then he would go on um, Requiem for Heavyweight is probably the one that people know the most. Uh, one, because it would then go on to be a movie as well. Um, but also just that's, uh, they, that teleplay got rebroadcast and given international casts throughout the time period of four or five years that it was first released. So uh, it's about a uh, aging boxer who um, has, it's very subtle, but has some sort of mental disorder from the boxing and it's mm -hmm. made him difficult to start a life after boxing. Very, Rod Serling himself was a boxer. So there's a lot of like personal through line in there, but it was very much about these, you know, nuanced aspects of masculinity that weren't really being talked about that were then threaded into what I think Rod Serling was feeling himself um, being from a veteran from the war, mm -hmm. having his own, you know, he doesn't act out, outright talk about post-traumatic stress from the war, but I think that it would be uh, hard to say that he wouldn't have had some sort of post-traumatic stress. And he wrote that into these shows. Like, so and you many... mentioned, I was going to say, you mentioned in the book too, talk about like, like a uh, mental health awareness, something that for him was, I, cause I, if I remember right in Wrecking for a heavyweight, it, it's mountain, right? It's Jack Palance who, who plays him. Isn't he talking to a counselor who's, who's essentially kind of saying, Hey, you should retire and help this, uh, kind of like this orphanage, these kids, you know, up in like upper New York or something. But that's something that, you know, when you talk about like PTSD, something that Serling would have probably only known as shell shock at the time. Yep. But the fact that he, he was talking about counseling and mental health awareness when something like you said, you know, he was a fighter in the war, like he was a boxer, you know, like these were things that were very much uh, inspired. They were created from his own experiences. Yeah, no, exactly. And you see that throughout his other teleplays as well. There's one specifically, well, first there's one called The Comedian that stars Mickey Rooney that mm. is aces. It's hard to see a good qu picture quality of, I think you can find it on YouTube, uh, but it's basically about this like big family entertainer who is a complete monster behind. And it's played by Mickey Rooney famous for being a children's, you know, actor in the, in the early days of Hollywood. But what the, the, what goes, he, there's a lot of like internal Hollywood entertainment world politics that he writes into a lot of his work because mm -hmm. he felt so strapped in by censors, hence why the Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. um, but he did another show uh, called The Velvet Alley. And The Velvet Alley is uh, essentially probably the closest thing to uh, a straight autobiographical work that he ever mm -hmm. did. Okay. Um, there are a couple episodes of The Twilight Zone that speak to more an autobiographical tone that Rod Serling wrote in. So Walking Distance, um, uh, next stop at Willoughby's, I want to say. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So there's some of those that have that in there, but the Velvet Alley was specifically about his transfer from New York and the world of television at the time to California and Hollywood mm -hmm. and the the emerging new world of television that was coming because they had so much studio space and mm -hmm. live performances were becoming less and less of a, of a thing. And during that time, as he was getting more and more popular, he had to uh, fire his like long-term agent who like mm. got him all of these jobs. And he felt really demoralized and he felt like he was becoming something that he wasn't or that he didn't want to be. And I think part of his move into the Twilight Zone, I think was some way of a, of a reflection on the direction of his life at that stage. Um, but in, in almost a... Uh, Bob Fosse did this with all that jazz too. Like he wrote himself a really like downer ending to his proxy on screen, uh, uh, almost as a way of, of, of maybe waking himself up or to, to, to just, you know, say to himself, remember where you came from kid. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, then after that, he started doing the twilight zone and then the night gallery. But, um, these, these, these things of, of, of digging into to who he is, uh, he replicated all throughout the twilight zone, all, all these things that he had been working up to and talking about, he then got to be more specific 
with the Twilight Zone in, in a way that sounds counter because it's not about what he's writing about, but it's more than what he got to do with all these other ones. But I would say, if you are a fan of the Twilight Zone, uh, the television, uh, the the teleplays that he did, most of them are available on YouTube. And if you're a fan of Rod Serling, at, at least Patterns and A Town Has Turned to Dust and uh, Requiem for sure. Heavyweight, those are solid gold. And I would actually recommend the Requiem for Heavyweight movie because it has Rod Serling's original ending. Rod Serling originally wanted that that teleplay to have a very downer ending mm-hmm. that they were they forced him the the ending as you probably know of Jack Palance going to the the home in upstate to like teach the kids like it's very nice very great but mm-hmm. that's not the direction his life goes in the in the in the in the movie and um Adrian, Adrian, uh, I can't remember his name right now off the top of my head. Famous uh, actor played uh, the Jack Palance character, mm. but he but really, really phenomenal, uh, phenomenal stuff. Um, also, if you can find the British one, uh, Sean Connery. Plays I, I, I saw you mentioned that in your book and made me I'm like, I'm going to have to find see if it's out there on YouTube, because that just sounds amazing. Uh, yeah, just, you can definitely see some perfect. pictures for sure. Yeah. And well, all before Scorsese starts, kind of, you have to wonder, is Scorsese in New York changing the channel on WPIX or whatever it was? And he's like, hey, record room for heavyweight. He would have been of the right age to probably see it. And you, you mentioned patterns, which uh, you mentioned in, in the book, the story, the fact that uh, Serling and his wife at the time, I think it was Carolyn, you know, the night his thing comes out and, uh, you know, I, I've written a few things i've you know as a comic book artist i've drawn a few things you've written a few things and i'm just thinking all right the night that my thing was going to be made and put on tv is probably the night that i'm going to be incredibly anxious you know panicked excited all of that put together but i'm going to be at home to watch it but no he and his wife go out to celebrate you know kind of like a a belated birthday and then the housekeeper or whoever it was is at home thinking like oh you're not going to get bothered tonight don't worry about it just to get bombarded with congratulatory calls, people saying, oh my God, what you did is so good. I, I just wonder if that's a, a bit of a sneak peek into obviously this movie that you're going to have to write, Jacob, about Serling and who he was because there, there's a lot of confidence in him. And then I think at other times, like you know, we've been kind of talking about, there's this kind of a tortured artist in him that's just kind of, leave me alone, let me do my thing. And don't get in the way because I'm confident enough to know how to tell the thing. Like I, I know how to get there. And when you mentioned Antioch, doesn't he go back and teach at mm-hmm. Antioch yeah. later in life? I want to say he also taught at another college too, okay. maybe in upstate New, another place in upstate New York, maybe. Uh, but yeah, he did go back, uh, and that was something that he, after Twilight Zone, feeling so really kind of depleted by it, he felt that going back and doing these. Uh, being a teacher and, and being able to give, you know, his advice that way. He also did a lot of speaking tours uh, in his later career. Um, that was, you know, a way for him to, uh, to like really kind of give back a lot of that um, advice. I can't imagine being in his class, not only from his own experiences, you know, in the world, in the war, and then in theater in Hollywood, in the studio system, outside of the studio system, having had some success to then be in his classroom to get that perspective. And then on top of that, the fact that he was just a damn good writer. Um, and that, like you said, he had the charm to make you like kind of follow along in his story that uh, at a time when you would hope all of those classes would have been recorded and that they were all available, that would be great to watch some of them. Cause I'm sure uh, some of the people in his class were very lucky to be able to get some of that, like Serling, just like straight from him. Oh yeah, I I wish I could remember who the writer was, but there was someone who attended his classes that like wrote a small essay uh, just about how you know warm and inviting he was for someone that <laughs> had to deal with so much of like as you said, like there's this like lack of self confidence. Like he, I think there's a part of him for not staying around to watch Patterns Live that was like I can't, I just sure. can't. I just can't anymore. <laughs> but I think there's also part of him that was like, uh, you know, he the the teleplays that he had done up to that point, he had done like 
four or five uh, weren't like big hits. So he's probably mm-hmm. like, man, just another one. No one's going to pay attention. And uh, much like all of his life, it explodes in his face and, and he has this, you know, thing to carry on. But yeah, I, uh, I want to say, I don't know if this is one of those things that like I made up in my mind because I was like theorizing what he could have been doing as a teacher in the late 1960s on a college campus. Like what could he have been doing? What could possibly have been passed around in all of these college campuses? Did he did he take LSD with his students once? <laughs> like, did he think about the world in these ways? I do know that like uh, there was a, a group of um of writers, Richard Matheson, Charles Beaumont, Rod Serling, all of them, like, I don't know if they ever smoked pot or anything, but like, definitely (laughs) those, uh, those things are in his, uh, in his uh, mythos, I say. Mm -hmm. Uh, But also that could just be me looking for the where they where I want the story to be. But there's um, there's a story there, Jacob, you can almost see him, you know, you start with his origins as a as a kid, you know, as a college kid, partying it up you know trying to impress the girls you know being very much a charmer and then having him go to war and then kind of coming back after the success of twilight zone to the very college where he was you know enjoying his his youth and then now from a very different perspective being a mentor being an educator you know that that would be a story that I think a lot of people would think this did not happen just to google it and find out that no actually the the truth is this this is exactly what happened Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, there's a, uh, there's just so many like great potential stories out there about Rod Serling, but I will say one thing, um, uh, there is a recent movie, you know, no one's really gone into Rod Serling's life. I do know that there is a movie being written in production somewhere that is about Rod Serling's life. I can't for the life of me remember who is the writer on it, but someone that you would recognize the name. Sure. <laughs> uh, but there's a movie called The Vast of Night that came out maybe two or three years ago, a small indie run. I think it probably dropped at the top of the pandemic on Amazon. So you can see it on Amazon. This is probably the best Twilight Zone movie of recent years. Um, very much written as an homage to Twilight Zone. The the writer and the director are very conscious of, of doing that. But I think what makes it uh, a little more special to me coming off of writing this book uh, and really falling in love with the mind of Rod Serling is that the main character, there's, there's two main characters, a, 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 a woman and a man, both like teens in high school, working in a small little, uh, little town in the middle of nowhere, Texas. And they get a strange radio signal and the radio signal leads them on this sort of alien adventure. Uh, well, the, the, the man in that duo is, I can't imagine that they didn't try and base it directly off of Kid Rod Serling. The okay. Rod Serling that I just <laughs> mentioned to you, that's just this like smooth talker and like really just being a pure ladies man. Like that's on screen in this. And it's probably the closest thing to uh, to a fake Rod Serling biopic sure. that you can find <laughs> at the moment. Uh, but definitely if you want to get a vibe for what I believe Rod Serling was really like, or especially in those younger days, like Vast of Night, absolutely captures it so all right so you've got the mini binges right and i think this is where yes you get the cerebral and the scary but then you also have the funny like the charming ones that are out there as well because those are all facets of who rod serling was like you know he just wasn't you know a sci-fi writer or fantasy writer or a historical fiction writer there was actually you know there was a romantic in him there were times where you saw in some of these episodes a little bit of that gothic romance even too so all right so jacob you know put you on the spot so like what's your favorite episode just like in the book if you can only watch one having seen 150 plus episodes having seen them you know as a kid and now as an adult with a very different lens What's the one that you're like, all right, if you only get one, this is, this is the one you're watching. So I won't say the one that's in the book. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Book (laughs) one definitely is a, I have a very good reason for that one. And uh, I won't spend too much time saying all of the other ones that I could possibly say for number one. But if I am going to say what I think is uh, my personal favorite and I'm looking at the two and I'm like waiting, <laughs> begging, drawing it out so I can really figure out. I'm going to have to say 
it's a good life. Um, I, the uh, Billy Mummy, little boy sending mm-hmm. out people to the cornfields. This is a story that gets to the heart of the atomic fear, the nuclear energy uh, anxieties that were coming out of this. It's very uh, subtle harbinger over it. Just this mm-hmm. idea that your world has totally changed and it can go up in a flame. But what I, what has really made it my personal favorite is just how it goes there. There are some, you, I mean, you can't see the things that they describe because it wouldn't have been okay to show that in the 1960s. Uh, but the, the situations that they describe much in the same way as like a great old uh, weird fiction, mm-hmm. like all of these, you know, not specifically H.P. Lovecraft, but, you know, uh, August Derleth and M.R. James, like these people that set up these things, these, these, these uh, sort of like eldritch horror type stuff. Precisely. And I, mm-hmm. you know, it's a good life is very much balances precariously on the edge of a Lovecraftian uh, uh, narrative mm. by the sheer fact of this young boy who has real true godlike powers because he disappears everybody it, 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 going back and, and really like listening into the world building that that episode does is to me what makes it all the more frightening mm. um because you get a much larger idea of just how truly evil this little boy is in a way that you only get so much from like seeing the Jack in the Box guy, sure. or or seeing, uh, you know, the whole idea of sending out to the cornfield, or or even the stuff that you get in the really fantastic uh, Joe Dante segment in Twilight Zone the movie, mm-hmm. like you get all these like really cool things that you can take away from it, but it's those quiet little stories that people are saying, or the the glances that the adults in the room are having at each other, or you know those are the bits and pieces that really support the the true horror at the heart of that episode. Uh, if I was going to say second one, the after hours, but who doesn't love some killer <laughs> mannequins? <laughs> after hours is so good because she, the actress does such a good job of, you know, just, just feeling at times. And this is a compliment feeling at times lifeless, like feeling exactly like you would imagine a mannequin should be, but also there's so much existential horror in that episode. I mean, that's tackled in a lot of other episodes. I think it's the, what is it? There's the one with the couple who end up like in a suburban home. They don't know how they got there just to find out that they might be the plaything for some child or thinking about like toy story before toy story, the, the doll, the clown, the, the soldier, in the shoebox, and it turns out they're like in a donation bin. I mean, j- so many questions about life and what it means, and it's it's very heady, cerebral stuff. But thinking back to Bill Mummy and how he played that kid, he was so unlikable. Like you just wanted to see, like if gods do spiting, I wanted to see that got that god spitting. I I don't know what the term would be. No, I got you. But I got you. The dad is I'm thinking I haven't seen that in forever, but I remember the dad. There was a moment where he was tying his shoes and he was talking to Bill Mummy as the kid and he was like on the edge of his bed and there was something very like um I can't remember leave it to beaver the dad the cleaver uh but there was something very like 50s dad about his thing but also something that you know like seeing it when you're older and I have to imagine, you know, as you're going through these episodes for the book, you're seeing them also with like your life experiences, you know, with a maturity there too, that I'm like, you know, it takes a lot to be empathetic towards a kid slash God who's so spiteful, who with the wrong word will disappear you, but he's still being paternal. He's still trying to like give him a life lesson, even though he knows if he doesn't say it the right way or if he's he catches his kid at a time when he's being too impatient it's like boom gone yeah yeah well and that too like one um this is an episode of a 1960s tv show where the audience is rooting for every single character to kill that kid like that's not happening in any other tv Mm -hmm. show at that time but two uh 
the idea that you know you see this godlike power that's that's you know the the story that rod serling tells you at the very beginning but then as you're watching them like not wanting to say one word not wanting to 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 Mm -hmm. set him off at at any possible moment then you recognize the world war that we just went that they just went through and you think about all those dictators and all those autocrats all those world leaders who caused so much global destruction all because of their own ego and self Mm -hmm. then you realize oh well maybe it's more than just a creepy little kid Mm -hmm. you know maybe it's maybe there's more that he's trying to to say here and talk about what happens when absolute power is given to someone that we think is incorruptible sure And then they go get corrupted and <laughs> do a lot of damage. But I will say uh, on on the on the it's a good life episode. Mm-hmm. So um, that was originally going to be uh, a Twilight Zone movie. Uh, mm. Rod Serling, when he was first considering doing a Twilight Zone movie back around the time that the show first ended, or maybe it was during the time when the show was still going on, uh, they were considering doing uh, feature-length versions of episodes. Okay. Uh, and It's a Good Life was was one of them. So they had this very long, um, much a little bit more of a happy ending. They have okay. some sort of conclusion in there, but still 90 minutes of wanting a kid to die. Um, <laughs> but the... That obviously didn't get made, um, but they did do a sequel episode hmm. uh, for the 2000s uh, episode, uh, 2000s revival of the Twilight Zone that came out in 2000, late 2000, no, no, early 2002, I would say, because um, it was like right after 9-11 that this mm-hmm. happened. Twilight Zone seems to pop up right after something big happens sure. in society. Uh, but this episode, um, one of, there's uh, the 2000s Twilight Zone is, very hit and miss uh when it does hit it hits pretty good uh it doesn't hit great uh but this episode um i think it's called it's still a good life picks up um you know 40 or some odd years afterwards when uh the boy is now uh, a grown man um and it's still billy mummy because okay you know, he was doing i think deep space nine at the time like he was still constantly working in like small sci-fi shows sure they bring back cloris leachman as wow. well okay so they bring these two direct ties back to serling's original episode and it's now about what happens when the young boy with godlike powers has a child of his own Mm. And what does what does that do to him when he starts to see himself in that child and what that can then, you know, do to them both to kind of free all of the the trapped people in his little tight community. Um, So, yeah, it's I mean, it's there aren't really any other sequel episodes to The Twilight Zone out there, but uh, it's a good life, isn't it? I have not seen the more recent one by Jordan Peele, the, the kind of like the rebooted version uh the most recent one very unfamiliar with the 2000s one uh it's interesting that i think in a modern iteration of the twilight zone probably and tell me if uh, if you would agree here i think black mirror is probably the closest thing to something that feels as i don't know as weighty as relevant as as the twilight zone was but obviously you know kind of maybe focusing focusing more on technology you know, but but still, in, in, in Black Mirror accomplishes a lot that I think you it'd be hard to argue in the writers' rooms that they weren't inspired by the Twilight Zone. Yeah, and um, I mean, Black Mirror, for all intents and purposes, is the new Twilight Zone. Like, I can I feel confident saying <laughs> that because of what it has done uh, as like a cultural boom um no other anthology genre show like it has had such an impact especially in terms of like threading in socially relevant issues and storylines and themes into stories that uh, as you said are much more technologically bound than uh the twilight zone which is far more fantasy and sci-fi and horror but i think um black mirror much like the twilight zone kind of mushes it all together into its own thing uh but the new Twilight Zone, Jordan Peele's, that's the main compl- uh, complaint that I have against it. Uh, okay. I think that there are a lot of, I think there, I think people should watch it. I think that there's a lot of great substance there. I think in the second season specifically, there's a lot of great like individual episodes from um, specific directors uh, okay. and specific writers um, that uh, are, are great. But 
they don't feel like a Twilight Zone episode. Mm. Um, and that's the same thing that sort of happens with the 2000s, the Twilight Zone as well, is that it doesn't have the same, I mean, one, the 2000s Twilight Zone was shot when digital video was just hitting sure. for major television networks. This was on UPN. Mm -hmm. The lead singer of Corn did the theme song. <laughs> like there's a lot of uh, things going against it, um, but they didn't do what the original show did and they weren't trying to tell something more. They weren't trying, they were just telling a, it was a, just an anthology show. We've all seen horror anthologies. I look at the new, I look at the 2000s Twilight Zone and I see a, are you afraid of the dark for adults? Like, sure. And that's mm -hmm. not a bad thing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that's my bread and butter. That's why I, I, I do I like some of what I see in the 2000s Twilight Zone. Um, much in the same vein, like the 2017, 2018 Twilight Zone, uh, it has the same vibe like it, it it has more iconography and it has more intentional layering in of like this is all the old twilight zone stuff and we're putting it into our new spin on things but to kind of go back to something i mentioned before if jordan peele had written the first five episodes and had shaped the the the, the core storytelling device of, of what he wanted to do and really like was the through line there yeah. I think that's what could have made the big difference for it. And I think that that's, you know, nobody's asking my opinion, but when you, when you inevitably reboot Twilight Zone yet again, get someone that writes the majority of it. Like, I think that, I think here's a, here's a great example. I don't know if, uh, if you're, how well aware you are of channel zero, which was, uh, sure. uh, yeah. Uh, and another sci-fi. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Another anthology show, uh, different vibes clearly. Um, but, they did the right thing and they have one person that's like not just the showrunner but like the person that's pushing creatively the tone and the vibe and the voice of that show rather than having a bunch of different people in the mix like rod serling was the person holding the staff and everyone was joining him at the at the, at the helm that's sort of what i envision that this would have which is why i think the 1980s twilight zone mm. is a little bit more in line with what the original show was i mean a it was much shorter amount of time between when the twilight zone ended and when the new twilight zone began a little bit about 20 years um but uh they didn't have one unique showrunner like mm -hmm. um like rod serling or even sure. jordan peele did but they did have one harlan ellison harlan ellison was uh part of the writing writer's room. And I know that he pitched some stories, but he uh, butted heads more with producers than other people did. He sounds like he was a, a, a little bit of a wild card of a person. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, and he, but... and he was a contributor, I mean, to one of the original uh, you know, kind of like in, in the outer limits where they use his story that eventually I think evolved to Terminator, you know, after, after they resolved the rights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so what the 85 Twilight Zone had, and I had to sort of like do my due diligence and digging to find it. Um, there was a writer who you might know from his uh, biggest property, uh, Alien Nation, uh, Rockney S. O'Bannon. Mm -hmm. um, and really, Alien Nation was kind of his biggest thing. And, and then he's continued to work on television. But he was kind of the main central person that was writing the first two seasons of the 85 Twilight Zone. Um, so there was this like semi through line of Rockney S. O'Bannon's voice throughout mm. this that gives it this very, uh, I don't know, um, it's not as clearly defined as Rod Serling's voice, but it gives it this more of like fun jovialness that I like, but it's also still digging into some sort of weirdness and some eccentricities. Uh, and two, the visually wise, what helped that show is that um, the first season of the new Twilight Zone was given to uh, this young upstart director who had just directed this new movie called Nightmare on Elm Street. Wes Craven <laughs> directed like the first five episodes of the new Twilight Zone. Okay. And you can see it on screen. You can see that like eye of Wes Craven there. And it gave the show its visual look. And there's still, you know, 
trying to needle into social issues, even uh, if it was not as overt um, as Rod Serling was, but uh, there's still quite a fair share of um, really cool episodes in that show that uh, a lot of people, you know, you think about the 1980s Twilight Zone, it doesn't have a great ring to it, sure. but there's some really solid, solid stuff in there that uh, I think people would appreciate now. I just have to, the second that you were talking about UPN, my brain went to this like 90s, early aughts vibe with, you know, shows like Outer Limits. And you mentioned Alien Nation. I remember it was made into, I want to say a few made for TV movies, but then it became the series as well. But shows like VR5, you know, that were around like that time of like X-Files before X-Files became X-Files, Millennium and things like that, that were... You know, again, like you think of X-Files, Chris Carter, you know, um, uh, Babylon 5, J. Michael Straczynski, creators that had such a singular vision that, you know, if someone's listening to this and they're like, what are you guys talking about? What is a UPN? <laughs> like, it's just another way of saying like all of those uh, shows like Babylon 5 that, uh, that I remember like dearly, it's because J. Michael Straczynski was allowed to tell his vision, you know, to, to failure or, or success in the ways that Serling was able to kind of tell his story. And even though you don't get a lot of Serling after you get a little bit in night gallery that has a little bit of that seventies feel um, encounters of the unknown where he does the narration. And, you know, I, I kind of feel at that point thinking about Lance Hendrickson in millennium, I remember reading an interview with him where he says, sometimes actors just take on gigs because they want to get a swimming pool or do an addition to their house. I'm just thinking if you're Serling at that time and maybe, um, you know, health and the studio system, you know, has kind of uh, frustrated you a bit, then having someone, a studio, uh, you know, a producer in Arkansas call you up and say, hey, would you mind doing some narration so that I can kind of, you know, make some money off your name? Like, that's kind of what I'm going for. He's like, sure, like, I, I can do that. That's fine. I'll narrate a few Jean Cousteau documentary type films or whatever but because he was able to just go in and just tell his story his singular story so well with of course the addition of charles bowman and richard matheson and some other folks but it's it's like twilight zone is serling serling is twilight zone it's him yeah no it is um they're they're two that are inextricable from each other um and even when he was doing all those commercials like he he really did become sort of a an ad salesman for a whole new generation that didn't grow up on him as twilight zone rod serling uh but it's it's almost like a it's the same vibe that Orson Welles did when he sure, was doing all sure. of those commercials back in the day too. I guess it was just the thing that geniuses did in the seventies. Um, but yeah, no, uh, I, I think that he just kept trying to follow and kept trying to, to get his work produced in, in whatever ways he, he could like right after the, right after twilight zone, he tried to get a Western made called the loner mm. and he got it made. He got like the first few seasons of it, but it was much more of like a philosophical heady uh, Western than what people wanted at the time, which was really more just gun smoke and then more gun smoke. Sure. Uh, yeah. So like it, it wasn't a big hit, hence why he ended up doing night gallery, even though he wasn't really super sold on it. It was something that they really brought to him. And then he slowly got pulled out of it. So the first like few seasons, you'll have some good quality Sterling stuff in there, but for the most part, it got really taken away from him. There's still great episodes of the, of night gallery. And I think the, the greatest bits of night gallery are all of his opening narrations. Sure. Cause he's so much more uh, self-deprecating mm -hmm. than that. He's so like far, it's like he was able to really shed all of the weight of his twilight zone moniker and just be really kind of silly and catty. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, he just kept, kept working he kept trying to get his, his his stuff out there but i i i think it's just you know it, it's tragic that he died right before a time period that would have seen just i mean you know you can't say like what would have happened but like what could have happened if sure. serling had seen had become like had you know uh, met spielberg again after giving him his first break and spielberg gives him this like new career opportunity with the twilight zone movie you know it's, it's all just tragedy lost to time but like 
it's still, uh, it's just, uh, it's a testament to, to his genius that we can feel that for him so far removed of like this uh, missed opportunity um, because of, you know, life, everything. <laughs> no, absolutely. So if all of this didn't entice you to go watch the Twilight Zone, then you definitely want to check out Jacob's book, uh, The Binge Watcher's Guide to the Twilight Zone, an unofficial journey. It's available on Amazon. It is a great read, Jacob. Really, really good. Uh, along with some of your other writing, people can find that at Linktree uh, slash Jacob Trussell, T-R-U-S-S-E-L-L, has direct links to all of your articles. They can hear directly from you on Twitter at J-E underscore Trussell, T R U. S S E L L. I, I, since this is your first book, I, I mean, way to go out of the gate, Jacob, with a great book with a great perspective that I think not only honors Sterling, but also I think you know goes back to the thing that you'd mentioned before on um, on the Emily Batson podcast. You have been able to tell your own thing, to kind of bring up your own work, and at the same time, maybe you know, bring up something that may feel old and dated because it's black and white, because it's from a different era, because it's from the 60s and bring some relevancy to people who may be just discovering the Twilight Zone now through a marathon, through a binge watch. And, you know, you're just making it uh, much more taking a modern take on it. So thank you for writing the book, but more importantly, thank you for your perspective and thanks for being on the show. No, thank you. I, I really appreciate you having me on. It's been great talking to you and I will always jump at a chance to talk about something that, you know, meant a lot to me beforehand, before I started writing this book. I always loved Twilight Zone. I have such, you know, if you read the opening of the book, you'll see all my memories about the Twilight Zone. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't until after this that it I, it made just such a profound impact on, on, on my own process, my own art and who I want to be and who I look up to. I'm, I've never been someone that has like heroes that I look up to, but like, I can't think of a better person to start with than, than someone like Rod Serling, uh, someone who was able to do things with the horror genre, with the science fiction genre that other people still take for granted today that it isn't something that's always been happening. But Rod Serling with what he was doing with the Twilight Zone and what he's doing with everything that he did was specifically trying to use the structures of everything that scares us and everything that makes us be filled with wonder to tell us something, not even so much about ourselves, mm -hmm. but about the world that we live in and the world that we live in now. And that's what makes the Twilight Zone still just so relevant today because as we've all found out 60 years ago and now aren't quite as far away as we really once thought. Um, but yeah, no, thank you so much for having me on. No, absolutely. Now I have to just convince you to get back so we can do a deep dive into uh, Fulci's The Beyond or talk about uh, the Poltergeist. Because like you said, if you're writing a book on it, but I also loved your take on it where you'd mentioned... Um, that you kind of like there's like the great American novel and then maybe Poltergeist could be arguably the great American horror movie. I, I, I think that's a great take on on Poltergeist and what it means when it was made. Um, a, a, absolutely. So might have to uh, twist your arm to come back to talk about bo bo both of those two. Don't have to twist it too hard. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome.